Okay, hi everybody, and welcome um, to our continuing work in Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 1, Section 1, and now we're starting on Part, um, part 3. So, I should put that down. And today is the 11th of July. Well, you know, I have a slightly different way of doing this. Um, as I say, uh, some of the material has been highly highlighted and with word enlargement, but I'm going by a simpler path and simply uh, maybe bolding a few things. It just works um, better for me, I think, and I hope it's okay for you too. Let's see if there's any, uh, well, the Tibetan ends program nine with an exhortation that you may one and all measure up to the opportunity and carry the work forward in the three worlds. Let me say that's where the work has to be done, even if it originates in the inner worlds going on and in the kingdom where the light of the soul streams forth in that kingdom too, um, is my earnest wish and desire. So you get the sense of the benevolence of the, of the teacher. He does end with exhortations now and then. And um, these exhortations, are meant to inspire us. They're meant to inspire us. And uh, I think they do. So, uh, leaning back a little bit here, and uh, excuse me for doing so, we'll go on to part three in section one, which is the uh, section that really begins a discussion of his intentions for the uh, book, well, at least it was made into a book, Discipleship in the New Age. <clears throat> As you face this opportunity in a world which is passing through a major crisis, let me say, you know, the run up to the Second World War, the end of the great, the second phase of the Great War from 1914, which finally ended in 1945, and DK goes on, I would like to state that it is necessary for all working brothers and disciples to have three things in mind if they are to work efficiently and as desired. That word brothers, may I say, always used to throw me. Um, I, I thought somehow it referred to men, but not at all really. Uh, DK referred to all his students as brothers. Maybe it's because the human kingdom is a masculine kingdom and the Deva kingdom a feminine kingdom. So uh, eventually that became straightened out in my mind when I ran into the uh, lists of 
the real names of those who were uh, participating in this work, and so many were women. Master Moria tells us that, and, and wisely so, I think, that women are bringing in the new age. Okay. So, there are three things here, and we'll try to understand what they are. Number one, first, disciples should know that the masters have three grades of workers. There are those doing the difficult work in the outer world. They materialize the forms through which the hierarchy can express its intentions. And they make the human contacts. Probably many of us are in that, um, in that category. Um, but let's see what he says about the others. And it is difficult work, let me say, in the outer world to materialize the forms through which hierarchy can express itself. And uh, the masters themselves are not generally making human contacts. And those who get a good teacher, let's say, and they refer to such a teacher as a master, well, let me say they're probably overestimating the caliber of the teacher, as good as the teacher may be. So DK goes on, there are many such disciples, and they are doing this work from their own free choice, and because they have realized the immediate and coming need of humanity and have pledged themselves to serve. Now, note the themes. Need, the realization of need. You know, if we're selfish, we're never going to even think about the need of others. And then the pledge. Uh, one can be then, at first, an accepting disciple, then a pledged disciple, and finally, uh, an accepted disciple, which kind of rounds out a sequence. And once you've made that promise, well, I say to myself and I say to you, we better keep it. Now, the next, um, okay, let me just get this. The next, there are secondly, those who act as links between the elder brothers of the race, the masters of the wisdom, who embody the divine plan, and the uh, more outer workers. Repeating, there are secondly, those who act as links between the um, elder brothers of the race and uh, who are the masters of wisdom, who embody the divine plan and the workers mentioned uh, above. Well, when you are a chela in the light, I would say that you definitely have a linking disciple. And so many of us are chelas in the light or have recently been so. Um, DK goes on, I do not say they act as links between the disciple and his master, 
for that is the direct relationship which none may touch and let me say that I think that really begins at accepted discipleship and goes on to more advanced stages. So DK says, uh, it is the direct relationship, particularly in the more advanced stages, like uh, Shela on the thread, Shela in the aura, uh, and uh, Shela in the heart, within the master's heart. No one is going to um, become the intermediary of that kind of relationship. But in general, there is this linking function at the appropriate stage of discipleship. Um, I'm so uh, tempted, you know, to start with my colors and larger uh, bolding and all that, but uh, it's difficult for me to lean forward and uh, and I think uh, it can flow a little better this way. Um, this, DK goes on, this second group of working disciples, however, act as intermediaries in the working out of the plan in the world, and they hold themselves in readiness to go anywhere when requested, thus aiding with their wisdom and experience and supplementing the capacities of the field workers, conferring with them. The field workers are pretty much, let me say, uh, ruled by the third ray generically. And this has a little bit of the suggestion of Master Decay, because the reputation that he has, I can't, I'm sorry, remember where I read about it, was that um, he was willing to go anywhere and do anything uh, on the uh, advice or suggestion of his superiors. So he was a man in motion, we might say. And uh, a certain amount of, let us say, humility uh, would be required to do that. Uh, he. I think, in many ways, has been distinguished by a particular kind of humility. Uh, he also tells a story about how he was kind of proud of his relationship with Master K.H., but uh, there's nothing like being burned on the stove to help us not put our hand there again. So, um, there are these, a second group of working disciples. And um, DK goes on to say, there are several such that are being um, sent expressly into the field at this time to hasten the work wherever possible and to increase the magnetic attraction of those centers through which the spiritual force of the new age can flow. But obviously, let me say that these intermediaries um, 
are of a higher rank uh, than the field workers who are specifically working with a number of human beings. The, the intermediaries work with the disciples or aspirants who are working with the human beings. Uh, we read sometimes of the Master Jesus having his own group within the high church, but that's already uh, a higher caliber. And the chelas are maybe not to be considered field workers because they have great responsibility within, let us say, either the Catholic Church or the uh, Episcopal Church. So um, let's say we have to stay on guard that we think that the work that Master Decay has been doing and about which we read is the only such work. It's certainly not the, the only such work. But we'll learn more as we go and uh, our places of ignorance will be uh, filled in with light. Now, he goes on to say, this is all being done preparatory to the supreme effort which the hierarchy of masters plans to make. This was written a long time ago and we're getting closer and closer to that time and I think we can rightly say that the hierarchy of masters, at least a certain number of them, plan um, as forerunners of the Christ uh, to um, externalize. This is, we're talking here about the externalization of the hierarchy. And let me say that in many ways we're reading the menu for the meal, you know. There's going to be uh, quite a banquet of uh, spiritual teaching, but right now we have the promise of it through the menu of the plan, let us, let us say. So DK goes on. Should all of you in the field at this time, uh, and I get the sense that he's working largely for those, or talking largely to those who are within the field, not exclusively, but quite a bit, uh, repeating, should all of you in the field at this time work with complete surrender and devotion, giving all of all your time and interest to the cause? Um, it does sound demanding. But at the same time, we begin to realize that surrender and devotion, although cultivated very much in Pisces and on the sixth ray, are foundational attitudes uh, and are needed. I wonder which of us, if any of us, can say that we have worked with complete surrender and devotion. Sometimes I feel I'm in the groove and doing that, but then I always find some exception which um, falls short of the ideal. But should it happen, and he says, all of us, doesn't just say, one, one, I'm sorry, one of us, 
It may be possible, he goes on to say, to prepare the ground in such a manner that the coming effort of the masters may prove adequate to the emergency. Well, something was emerging for sure, and it was pretty much going to be the Second World War. But the problem is much greater than that. Uh, uh, humanity was coming to the point where entry into the Fifth Kingdom by many would be possible but only if rightly uh, pursued. And that, that's a big change of uh, state, isn't it? Think back to the days, maybe uh, 21 million years ago, you know, we can throw around uh, <laughs> dates like that. <laughs> of course, what did they mean to us? But when animal man became human, the firestorms, the death of forms, the uh, explosions almost, you might say, within the head of animal man who uh, was being informed by a solar angel or angel of the presence. It was a tremendous time of emergence and emergency. And we've been with that fourth kingdom, the human kingdom, for a very long time. And now comes the opportunity to be a member of the fifth kingdom of nature, the kingdom of souls. And then with right cultivation, we can move on eventually to the kingdom of planetary lives. It might not take so long as the span of time from the beginning of the human kingdom to the beginning of the kingdom of souls. So there's an accelerating turn of the spiral. Now, we have uh, a few groups and uh, now he tells us about the third group. He says, the third group is that of the masters themselves and their cooperating initiates, which uh, we do not claim to be. Uh, if we have any kind of elevation over simply field workers, it would be as intermediaries. But there are initiates surrounding the masters. The Buddha himself uh, worked with those who were becoming uh, arhats, that is, initiation, uh, initiates of the fourth degree. And I think the word arhat has the connotation of being noble. But still, they. <laughs> They needed correction from the Buddha. They needed uh, supervision. They were not perfect. So let's just say uh, initiates of the third degree and the fourth degree, these might be called the cooperating initiates working with the masters. Now he goes on to say, they work primarily upon the inner side. But, of course, note carefully the word, not exclusively. I mean, Master D.K. will be, we're told, 
uh, an externalizing master and the master Jesus does show up for his um, outer groups and though he is an inner worker he makes his presence known to these more outer groups. Now, um, going on, their activities, that's the masters, I guess, are confined largely to the mental plane and to the scientific use of thought. And thus, thus they guide their workers and helpers and influence and direct their working disciples and world disciples. What is it to uh, be a world disciple? Well, I used to think, and I, I think it's pretty accurate, that an initiate of the third degree can be considered a, a, a world disciple uh, if his work is um, extensive and influential. Working disciples, in my view, are a slightly lower capacity, but um, all disciples are working. There's a place, I think, where the Tibetan ends a series of teachings Maybe it's the whole, the whole series by saying, work, my brothers. You know, the simplicity of that statement, no doubt, has arrested the thought of many. It certainly arrested my thought. It's so simple. It's like a hammer blow uh, emphasizing the essential. So we have the field workers and the masters themselves with their cooperating initiates uh, of the fourth and third degree. And let's see what we're really looking at here. Um, it's necessary for all working brothers and disciples to have three things in mind if they are to work um, efficiently and as desired. And then the three um, the three grades of workers, which it's good to know about, isn't it? I would say the field workers, the intermediaries and the masters and their surrounding initiates. Okay. Now, in terms of the three things in mind, this outline might be just three subdivisions of the first thing to have in mind. That's, uh, that's possible. And then the second uh, and the paragraphs connected are talking about uh, a larger category than three divisions of the three grades of disciples. DK is going on to say, there is at this time an inner intention of blending the Occidental and the Oriental approaches to the ageless wisdom and to the hierarchy. 
And let me say that in that capacity, I really uh, salute the work of AUM, uh, Ancient Universal Mysteries, uh, presently under the directorship of Keith Bailey, uh, and the way in which the Occident and the Orient are combined in the uh, rituals, Masonic rituals, which he created. So he has taken seriously what the Tibetan has said about the West and the East. Now, Alice Bailey had the AUM group, um, and it was in the 1930s. Um, and again, it was uh, largely related to the Scottish Rite, which is a division of masonry to which uh, I think Foster Bailey belonged. Um, so that was a, a quite an occidental approach. But it is possible to have, to combine both approaches, just the way the Buddha and the Christ, they do work together. So the blending of these two approaches, to blend them, no matter what the field may be. Cooperation and the mutual interchange of wisdom and of knowledge are essential if this is to be perfected. And uh, let me say there's so much misunderstanding, you know, to be an automobile with a well-meaning Christian uh, woman saying, I curse the Buddha. Okay, well, you know, ignorance is speaking. And uh, I was in uh, Kathmandu, uh, Nepal, and what little I could discuss with the uh, monks that were around um, and seemed to be part of a temple complex. They didn't have much good to say about Jesus. Um, it, it sounded to me simply like they were caught up in prejudice. As simple as that. Anyway, cooperation and mutual interchange of wisdom and of knowledge are essential if this is to be perfected, this blending of the Occident and the Orient. The objective of both methods, the uh, mystic and the occult, are the same. And here he seems to be calling, unless I'm mistaken, the oriental approach as the mystical approach, uh, and the occidental as the more occult approach. Well now, this is uh, maybe in the larger outline, the second category of the three things uh, that we have to have in mind. Uh, it is necessary for working disciples, may I say always that emphasis on the word work, uh, will be helped by that, but in the beginning of the Aquarian Age, because Saturn will be so 
powerful for everybody, even though some may enter the sign via Venus secondarily. So it is necessary for working disciples at this time to appreciate the immediate emergency. Now that that can that can pass without real observation. Maybe even now, let me say that we're in an immediate emergency which is not detected by millions. Yes, they may have some discomfort or privation or some financial challenges and health challenges, but the immediate emergency is a much larger thing. So DK goes on to say, there is a crisis in the affairs of man. This crisis must be viewed in terms of opportunity and not in terms of cataclysm and uh, catastrophe. Although, let me say that cataclysm and catastrophe did arise because humanity just couldn't stem the evil tide. Um, going on, DK says, just as in the life of an aspirant to discipleship, there comes a life or a series of lives wherein there is direct conflict between the soul and the lower nature. So there is now an analogous crisis upon our planet. Sometimes, you know, you look at somebody, maybe a Libra person or someone with a strong fourth ray, and you say, but why can't this person see the soul and acquiesce so that the soul is victorious instead of always giving in to the negative tendencies. But frankly, that is where they are. And they are as attracted to what we might call the negative tendencies as they are to the soul and its light. As a matter of fact, in the beginning, maybe they're even more attracted to the personality, the dweller, than to the light of the soul. And that's just the way it is. Uh, of late, within the United States, many younger souls have incarnated and they just don't have the experience to eschew selfishness. They still are attached to the fruits of selfishness and I suppose if we look within our own nature we will also find that our detachment from selfishness is not yet entirely complete. Going on then with DK, the object in both cases is that the soul may assume an increasing control over the form aspect. Now, let me say this has been an important objective for a long time. And it is um, crescendoing as we move into the age of Aquarius.
Well, these are challenging times. And if we don't realize that that is the case, metaphysically, occultly, even mystically, we will not be able to um, combat the forces of obstruction. So let's try to be realistic about the period through which we are passing and its difficulties. The, the entire first 120 years of the Aquarian Age will be difficult, we are told. That's a lot different, isn't it, from the song about harmony and understanding in the Age of Aquarius, which is filled with um, a song filled with a lot of wishful thinking. Now going on with DK, looking at it from another angle, the pla this planetary soul functioning as a hierarchy of masters is in direct conflict with the forces of evil. People don't realize the nature of the battle occurring within themselves and in the larger context. They just look upon it as wrong ideas or inconvenience or something of that nature. But really, there is a counterattack. The forces of light managed a victory in the Second World War. But the door where evil dwells, as the Tibetan reminds us from the observation of one of his, one of his more astute students, well, that's not over. The attack is is still on. And things are so accelerated these days that with supersonic missiles and so forth, the end of human civilization could come in a virtual flash. So let's realize the danger of the situation. Going on, um, there is a conflict. And I think DK is advising us that we must take a participation in that conflict. We're not to stand idly by and let the forces of evil prevail. DK goes on, it should, however, be borne in mind that those forces also constitute a hierarchy of entities. Maybe the triangle points downwards. So, also, a hierarchy of entities, but an inverted hierarchy, constituting the material forms, because these enemies are called lords of form, well, temporary enemies, and therefore in their place, but note, in their place, true and correct. 
that is uh, something we have to bear in mind. Selfishness itself has a place in the development of man. It concentrates his attention upon the uh, perfecting of the vehicle in a formal sense. So even though these are now considered the forces of evil, because we have, as it were, moved on apace, really, they were appropriate at a certain point in time for uh, the development of human evolution. So he says, it is a question in reality of what is the objective of any particular time cycle. And that's it. Do we even know that right now? There's a lot of uh, myopic straightening out to be done and uh, soon there will be a concerted attack upon glamour as we stand with massed intent. So what is the objective of any particular time cycle? Do we know it? And let's just say DK's ashram embodies the energy of right human relations. I think that's a pretty strong uh, objective. Um, but let's see what DK says here. The present objective is that the human family should now, and note the word family, and think about that wonderful book from 50 years ago called The Family of Man. It was a book of photographs, very illuminating and culturally um, interchanging an instructive book treating human beings as a family. Okay, but repeating now, the present objective is that the human family should now, as a whole, do three things and anything which militates against this is evil. So, this is um, the idea of knowing what we're doing within our time cycle. Well, number one, manifest the nature of the soul through the integrated personality. The nature of the soul is love and the will to good. And of course we could busy ourselves with the contemplation of what is the good. I've always considered it a blend of second-ray divine pattern with a powerful insistence behind it so that that pattern manifests. So one of the things we have to do, and are we doing it, is manifest the nature of the soul. Love. 
that little word, you know, and the will to good. If we could perfect those two requirements, what a different world it would be. And what else? Um, These, these are things that uh, humanity as a whole should somehow be accomplishing. Number two, transfer the energy now turn to the vitalizing of the physical body and physical creation, which is the sex energy, right, uh, going on, to the nurturing of the creative faculty upon the mental plane and that will mean that the throat center uh, becomes more highly activated because of the transference of energy from the sacral. Thus, the entire human family will be transmuted into a dynamic, self-conscious, creative agency. So as that energy rises to the throat center, the mental plane uh, has a point of expression. It becomes more important to the individual and this will lead to the transmutation of the individual, of his groups, of humanity as a whole. Thus, the entire human family will be transmuted into a dynamic, self-conscious, creative agency. And what else? in this little <laughs> section to do the three things against which the forces that militate are to be considered evil. So manifest the nature of the soul, transfer the energy, and I'm falling back into my old habits here. And number three, usher in a period of spiritual unfoldment in every kingdom in nature. Now, I'm not sure how much control we have over the kingdom of souls, maybe a little, as far as the kingdom of planetary lives and the solar kingdom will have to wait before the impact of our energy can do much in this um, ushering in. But certainly within humanity, within the animal kingdom, the vegetable, the mineral kingdom, spiritual unfoldment can occur. At the close of this period, the door into the animal kingdom will again be opened and opportunity offered to waiting embryonic souls. 
that's just a fantastic idea. And when you look at your pets, you know, an embryonic soul. And DK did say, although we might have to wait until the uh, fifth round, maybe, of this particular chain for the door to open again, even now in the fourth round, for some very advanced animals, the door is opening. I don't know where I can find it, but I was surprised to find that because he usually defers that event during which the animal, as in times of yore, uh, will become human. Many also, at this time, can take initiation, and hence the balancing of forces at either end of the human line of unfoldment. The animals are coming in, the ones that are qualified, and human beings are entering the kingdom of souls. This is to be brought about by the renewed psychic activity of the Great White Lodge. Let me say, now, after millions of years, again externalizing and being far more accessible to humanity. The time has come for that. So, again repeating, this is to be brought about by the renewed cyclic activity of the Great White Lodge. And will be carried forward through the medium of those energies which are ushering in the new age, let us say, of which Uranus is one en uh, such energy. This crisis is upon us almost prematurely, owing to the exceedingly rapid advance made by humanity since 1850. Quite a statement. The Industrial Revolution had kicked in and was going full tilt, but um, also the enemy was becoming apparent. Uh, the blood and the iron of Mars. And also there were coming in, we are told, advanced souls, probably on the fourth ray, who were bringing in uh, a very intense quality of beauty, trying to forestall the inevitable objectives of blood and iron. But anyway, here we are. Things move faster than we imagine. And thus it was with the fifth ray ashram moving faster than was safe and so had to be temporarily 
suspended in its uh, individual progress and placed under the general category of the third ray. Now we're just emerging from that period, I think. Through the driving urge of men themselves, a new realm and a new dimension has been contacted. Humanity has loosed energies hitherto unknown, and the effects are of a dual kind producing both bad as well as good results. I'm thinking of inventions in the realm of subtle energy, such as the X-ray and all the developments in electricity and the um, speculations which proved accurate about releasing the energy of the atom. All of this post-1850. Every once in a while, he throws in a particular date, which does not seem to relate to any cycle about which we know. Um, but in this case, obviously, a point of transition and something we have to take into consideration. And then the third of the, in the larger outline, is this. And then I think we'll call it a program. Let's see how much we've got. Yeah, we've still got quite a bit, and um, I'm not really able at this time to go through that. It's too, too demanding, too long right now. Okay. But number three, that we can do. Disciples, D.K. says, must now organize for a steady, united effort. This must take the form of a closer cooperation between all groups and a standing together in a closer relationship, thus strengthening each other's hands where possible and pooling resources. Well, hasn't always worked out that way, has it? We've seen even competition between the various discipleship groups and not a mutual reinforcement and a standing together, but not in all cases, of course. And increasingly, I think, we will see that valuing of each other's work and that standing together and that strengthening each other's hands where possible. It's not always possible. And the pooling of resources so that available to every disciple in discipleship group is more than otherwise might be the case. So a steady, united pushing forward. Um, 
It should also result, DK says, or result also, in a united push forward of all spiritual and occult agencies and the carrying of the truth along all possible lines, down among the masses of men. A united push forward. Let's see if we can be part of that. I know so many groups now that I really deeply respect and maybe my respect has grown as I've learned more and more about their objectives and also the difficulties which they face. And hopefully, as a more mature discipleship descends upon us, we will be able to really stand by each other. Going on with DK, just as in Atlantean days, spiritual forces were subordinated to selfish desires of men. So today, and how true this is, they are being subordinated to the minds and ambitions of men. And the results and maybe we're in it, will be profoundly evil. Well, DK is no exaggerator. He's not given to exaggeration. So when he talks about the ambitious, selfish mind, he's looking at it as even more problematic than the selfish desires of earlier times. Spiritual forces are subordinated to the minds and ambitions of men. We just have to look in the political field, especially and we see it remarkably present. The world situation, he says, demonstrates this. For, through material benefit and physical prosperity, might eventually emerge from certain countries where great, uh -huh, for though, that's it, material benefit, etc., might emerge. Let me start again. I messed that one up pretty good. So repeating, for though material benefit <clears throat> and physical prosperity <clears throat> might eventually emerge from certain countries, where great experiments are being undertaken, they are only examples, or they only, they will only exemplify the triumph of the form and will finally come to naught. So, we cannot base the value of our civilization upon material prosperity. They will only exemplify the triumph of the form and will finally come to naught. Just as every human being struggles through 
in someone life to personality achievement and let me say there's that fourth ray of struggle also ruling generically in a sense the fourfold personality so he says so it is among the nations that's let me say that's where we often are right now there are not so many nations that are working towards real spiritual demonstrations yet at the heart of every nation the Tibetan says lies latent the mystical soul and eventually after dire struggle and distress all will be well and let me say that I think the adolescent United States is going through this right now it has accumulated material wealth but that will not be an abiding condition and I think we will see many Americans realizing that they can live the spiritual life without all of those material and formal accumulations so DK goes on and says tendencies towards materialism and towards personality achievement must under the larger plan and the will to good be offset by a counter move of spiritual living and this must be the objective of all working disciples. Well, there's more, but we'll segue. And this is uh, up to page 20. And basically, we're looking here. This has taken us a few pages into it uh, and today is the as I say the 11th if you get rid of that XX and we will um, begin program 11 having completed uh, program 10 um, the following section, of course, does connect with what went before, but I think we'll be okay with that. I think we'll be okay. We'll just make a, a segue. And this is uh, the end of program 10. Um, and it went from 17 to uh, page 20 and it was the 11th and now we don't know when this will be taken up again we still have some work tonight on the uh, attracting of uh, financial resources for hierarchical purposes but we are definitely in discipleship in the new age volume one section one part three video commentary as you see the not so brief abbreviation and dk is uh, is telling where the real values are uh, coming up and it's along the line of love and not the accumulation of that which is appreciated most 
by the third ray in its more material aspect. Okay, friends, this is a um, program a little bit more than uh, an hour, maybe an hour and roughly 15 minutes, roughly. And uh, we'll continue when we can. Okay, when we can. Lots of love and many blessings to everybody.